third floor northeast corner. You don't think she's a little young for the hard stuff? Washington says she's a killer. Hi, everybody. I'm Peter Travers, and this is Popcorn, where we tell you what's going on at the movies. And I think there's no more exciting a going on than uh, Zero Dark Thirty, which you've just seen a scene from. And we are lucky enough to have the director of Zero Dark Thirty, Catherine Bigelow, with us today. Hello. Here you are, in triumph again. <laughs> I, I said this to you Thank before, you. I only see you when you're collecting awards. <laughs> well. Now? Um, it's exciting. Where's your Oscar, Catherine? Did you bring it with you? I did. did. No, no, I did. <laughs> you know, I, where does it go? I mean, you are. I have to get rid of this first because you are. The last time I saw you, you didn't win the Oscar yet. You didn't become the first and only woman to win an Academy Award for directing after 278 years of movies and Academy history. You're the one. So where where is it? Where have you placed it? Well. Um, First of all, it was such a surreal and surprising and shocking and humbling experience. Um, I placed it on a, on a table in the living room. You know, it was sort of um, interesting. It had been there forever, this, this particular piece of furniture, mm -hmm. in search of a purpose. And I suppose now it has one. <laughs> <laughs> so when in this process, after Hurt Locker comes out and releases this, does the germ of the idea for Zero Dark Thirty come? Well, right after we finished Hurt Locker, we were interested in making a movie about the hunt for Osama bin Laden. And mm -hmm. then, of course, it was just a failed hunt. He was still at large and somewhere on the planet. So you and Mark and both thought it was still a good idea to do a movie about a hunt where we don't have an ending. Well, in a way, there was an ending on this piece, and a very interesting, kind of very enigmatic one. But that I won't spoil because who knows if we ever will uh, tackle it. Oh, good, a prequel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, but, but the thing that was interesting was, um, you know, I suppose it's, it, obviously 9-11 was extremely tragic, very impactful, and this was the, you know, this, this, the specter of this individual was still out there. And we we're about two-thirds of the way through the screenplay when Osama bin Laden was killed. And so then suddenly it was like, you know, this moment where, you know, <laughs> is that either just a last act grafted onto the two thirds of the story before, or is, or is that hunt, the intelligence gathering for this compound in Abbottabad, is that the movie itself? And that became the movie mm. itself. Zero Dark Thirty. That's Zero it? Dark yes. Thirty, which is, which is a military term for 1230 at night. Like, they would say perhaps, oh, oh, 12, oh, oh, O Dark Thirty, mm -hmm. and meaning like the precursor to O One Hundred, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But we can take that even further in terms of the darkness of the subject, and well, the darkness of the subject, and also, you know, I certainly think you could characterize this decade with respect to the 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 hunt for Osama bin, bin Laden and what precipitated it with nine eleven as a very dark, long decade, and so that's sort of how it resonates for me as a title and and a and a phrase. When did the Jessica Chastain character of Maya, not the real name of the agent that's in the movie, but w when did you decide to make this woman the center of this movie? Well, Mark was about, I'd say, a couple months into his research. And I remember he was in D.C. and, and uh, called me and said, you know, there's, um, there are women at the center of this operation and there's one that's particularly significant and um, and then we both kind of arrived at the idea that it might be very interesting to center the story around her mm -hmm. and and since she was really pretty pivotal but that's not to say that there weren't a lot of people that were pivotal I mean it was a large well, we see team. the movie shows us a lot of people and a, yes, yes exactly but but there was you know there were these very um, tenacious individuals who kept, you know, at a particular lead that was at times somewhat unpopular, but nonetheless just drove that idea forward. And, um, and obviously it, it turned out to be a, a, you know, a rather good bet, but, um, but it was a lot of elements that 
got you to that house in, in Abbottabad. I mean, mm -hmm. there's obviously, as the film shows, some enhanced interrogation, interrogation techniques at the beginning. You have some politicians saying, no, you've made a movie that basically condones torture. Whether we call it enhanced interrogation, I don't know what, you know, it's torture, it's waterboarding that we're seeing it. And yet, have none of those people actually seen the movie that you made? in terms of where this is being Well, found. you know, I mean, I have great respect for those people. And, um, and obviously, their criticism is, is um, you know, is, is, is I, I take very seriously. Mm -hmm. Certainly based on our research, that's part of the story. And to have eliminated it to, would have meant we would have been whitewashing that story. Mm -hmm. So. That's part of the story, as our research showed. It was also not the most significant part, nor was it pivotal. Pivotal. Could we have found, we could, you know, the investigators have found the compound in Abbottabad without it? No one will know. I mean, or perhaps that'll be debated for quite a long time. As a filmmaker, I think if this is, um, obviously something that's a controversial issue, which it is, a healthy debate I, I think is helpful. You know, and so if a film has stimulated a debate, a conversation about something that's very um, important mm -hmm. and, you know, elements that were done in the name of finding bin Laden, then I think it's a real testament to the power of the medium. Does that leave you frustrated when you hear that kind of thing? Do you say, why don't they understand? Why don't they watch? Or can you just compartmentalize it and put it out of your head completely? Well, I think you have to, um, I suppose you have to compartmentalize to a certain extent. On the other hand, um, I do think that the voice of the critic, either positive or critical, mm -hmm is important to inform you as an artist and help you grow as an artist. You know, I think it's a relationship. There's a, a wonderful kind of sacred, mysterious relationship that happens between the artist and the critic. So I think that it's, it's really, really valuable. Yeah, but you get to be in that special category where you not only get the critics to do it, but you get politicians turned critics to do it. You know, so you're lucky. You have a whole other degree of people coming out and doing this, which is, I don't know how... I don't know if I'd call that lucky, a, but... I, I wouldn't call it lucky at all. <laughs> right. I don't know, because right. you can become somebody's agenda. That's all I mean by it. And that's what I mean by, it. is there any hurtfulness in that when you feel that what you've done is well, being used. I, sure, I mean, you feel that, certainly I think both Mark and I feel that the film's been mischaracterized and misunderstood, and I think, um, not by everybody, mm -hmm. because there are those people who see it exactly the way it was intended. So, but that's the nature of, I guess, a, a I suppose a, a piece of art put out there for discourse. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of have to let go and allow it to have a life, you know, of its own and um, guide it when you can, if you can. Mm -hmm. But um, but it's a very spirited discourse that it seems to be uh, stimulating. <laughs> Telling the story through their eyes and especially through the character of Maya. And you, you know, you, man or woman, can become on, you know, you're on her ride, you're on her journey and her obsession and her determination.